So the first question I was going to ask you was starting with your article in the book. So I wonder what kind of, I suppose we sort of touched on it, but what motivated you to write that article um, about representation in publishing? Um, I think just because I, I, I think um, gay slash LGBT voices mm -hmm. aren't really heard uh, mm -hmm. much. I don't think in the mainstream at all really actually regard you know like I, I was editor of attitude for eight years mm. and worked there for a long time and i think people would be shocked at how uh little um influence kind of lgbt narratives have or lgbt voices it's still considered to be kind of really niche by film fashion not i mean fashion different but you know tv radio um and the book industry you know i like the publishing industry but um they're all really nice <laughs> But um, they don't really get, they don't really get it just yet. And actually, there are lots of changes. Actually, like Penguin Random House, of, who published my book, Straight Jacket, mm. they do have this initiative to um, to try and make to bring out more diverse voices. But I think that tells you a lot, you know, that mm. that you shouldn't really need that. It's great they're doing it, but um, yeah, I think it was just a good opportunity to speak directly to the publishing industry because everybody reads the bookseller. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so I think we kind of just answered this, these sort of questions, but I was going to ask you about the pride shame uh, dimension and what you, because I, because of the books that I have article reading that I saw that you wanted more kind of positive um, representation of these relationships. So I wondered if you thought there should be more stories that focus on celebrating aspects of the LGBT community um, or whether you thought that tension is still present. Like, I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, well, I think it's always uh, appropriate to talk about issues and painful things and difficult things. And the fact of the matter is that, you know, being LGBT is still difficult for lots of people and certainly people in other countries and even people in this, you know, many, many, many people in in this country. You know, and there, you know my, my first book, Straight Jackets, about gay shame and the struggles people have and the drugs problems that exists in you know that is quite significant amongst some gay men um so there are all, are all of those issues but paradoxically it's it's the fact that there aren't more positive upbeat mm. stories that kind of c contribute to that and i just think um i just think there just needs to be it's interesting that like if i'm looking at books to read uh, about not that I do I don't just read gay books because you know like everybody my life is wide and expensive and I care about mm -hmm. lots of different things but it, it, so many of them are about the painful hiding away the burgeoning shocking oh my god can you believe I have these feelings that kind of experience and I think those stories were, I mean even with um, Call Me By Your Name I mean uh, nothing against that book or film at all you know like it's been a huge sensation isn't it? but it's just interesting that there's still and those stories will always be relevant because people will always be experiencing them, especially younger people. But it's kind of incredible that we're not in a place where, you know, that they that we're in. It's incredible that we're still in a place where those stories are kind of the dominant mm, narrative, yeah. really. And there's not huge amounts of showing, you know, what what happens next and just healthy, happy gay lives. And even the, the way they're told, like I really, like I just said a minute ago, I really love Love Simon because it's just. It's the kind of film there are mil millions of well you know thousands of films like that for straight people and i remember seeing critic a few critics when love simon came out kind of sneering a bit and saying young people are so cool and together and with it now that you know if everything's changed it's not like my generation you know they don't need a film like love simon to tell them to reassure them that's just not the reality you, you just need to look online and you see you saw the loads of you know millions of that certainly thousands and thousands of people gushing about that film and saying they were in tears when they saw it and even actually when i saw it there was loads of people like crying like young people older people so um yeah i, I, I really do think we just need positive stories as, as part of the mix and and especially for young people because i think young people do need to see when i when i came out i saw the youth group i went to they had a little filming evening and they showed a film called um prick up your ears which is the a biopic of um uh, Joe Wharton and it's an amazing film it's fantastic but my god it's bleak I mean it is incred incredibly bleak and uh yeah I wish I'd, I wish I'd not seen that film at that time because it just literally was like being hit over the head with a mallet of mm. goo 
it was just a horrible um as, and i love that film now it's just i just really i really needed films like love simon you said that you didn't really have any kind of source of representation in the literature you were reading as a child um that would replicate your own experiences so i wondered how whether you how important you thought it was that literature should replicate our feelings and how we experience things yeah i mean that, I, that's another reason why i suppose i wrote the bookseller piece and mm -hmm. some work on that that issue just because that's the the point of books you know to express human experiences and emotions and to kind of help us you know explore who we are and examine who we are and reflect who we are and know what's the point if you don't do that about the entire kind of you know um human experience you know the diverse reality of um you know the experiences that people have and yeah and as a as a young person there was literally nothing <laughs> I mean, there was just there was there was nothing there was nothing at all that i can think of i mean yeah i can't really think of it i mean yeah I mean, I talk about things like, like I remember reading Howard's End when, when I was at yeah. university and the teacher saying, why are you reading that? It's written by a homosexual. Um, you know, and even that's, you know, I didn't know that he was gay at that point. And his book, Morris or Maurice or whatever it's called, didn't come out until after he died. Didn't know about that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's really, really important because, mm. you know, yeah. Like I say, what, what what what's the point of books if you can't reflect, you know, wide range of experience? And, and it, I just think everybody needs. You, you, it's re I think it's really hard to just to exist in the world if you if you just feel like there's nothing to kind of um, there's no markers and there's nothing to kind of grip onto. There's no kind of way of seeing yourself reflected. And mm. I mean, it's amazing that over the last five, six, seven years, that's kind of exploding. Mm. Um, but there's still a fair way to go, I think. Mm. Yeah, because I was talking to my tutor saying, because uh, about the kind of school thing, that I don't really remember having, I mean, the last few years ago, having, that we ever actually did any kind of books in school that were specifically focused on, like, gay or LGBT um, community sort of in the context of what we were looking at. And it may have been that if we read something like that, an issue, like, that would have come up and we would have talked about it if that had happened but I don't feel like we focused on it if you know what I mean until I got to university and only then was there then that kind of platform for those kind of for talking about that kind of thing so I still I don't feel like it's I feel like it's got a long way to go in schools probably in the way they approach it in education yeah I mean I think there's been a really big from my perspective there's been a real change in the sense there's loads of books published now like young adult books in particular yeah seem to have gay uh, and and some of the, which are specifically gay themed like si uh, love simon i know it's got a different title as the book um, but lots of others that are including lgbt characters as like maybe the main character or the side character or whatever it could be but it's going to take a long time before those so, so you get you get quite a lot of those but you get very few what would be considered like classics of the genre so yeah. i suppose love simon would be i think it's called simon versus the homo sapiens agenda um big, big chunky title um so that's maybe a standout title and then there's books by Adam Silvera which maybe might be considered to be becoming standout titles but it takes a long time for them yeah. to percolate through to, until they might be discussed in you know context yeah. of education or something yeah yeah and um, and then the next question I had was based on what you wrote in the book so what was your what are your views of how publishing will change in its attitudes towards publishing works by members of the LGBT community in the next few years, specifically trans voices. So, Say that again. How do you feel that the publishing industry will change in the next few years in its attitudes towards the LGBT community and publishing works by them? I think the publishing industry is definitely trying. Parts of it are definitely, you know, kind of have their heart in the right place. But I think it's very, you know, it's difficult because we're all different. So, for instance, I, I it's not like, I, I think we can get into a position where as a gay person, you're sitting there going, oh, they're all terrible because they're not gay and how awful, like it's a terrible thing to be straight. It's not a terrible thing to be straight in the same way that I'm not black, I'm not Asian, I'm not a woman. So I don't know what those experiences are like and I don't know how to reflect them, you know, as well as a, a woman or an Asian person or a black person would do. So I think the key thing is us all understanding that those we need to listen to people from those communities to hear what they say about what they think is needed. 
Um, and I, I'm not completely convinced the publishing industry understands that. And certainly in my experience of LGBT stuff, do they understand that they don't understand, uh, if that mm. makes sense? You know, that they need, they do need to... I think there's quite a lot of books that are getting published that seem to be a straight person's idea of what a gay book should be or what is of interest. And there's all this this kind of thing about, like, well, let's make it interesting to a wider audience, a straight audience too. And in some cases, I think that's completely valid, but I also do think there needs to be books that are specifically targeted towards LGBT audiences, like my book, Straight Jacket. You know, when I was pitching that, I had one publisher say, why is it all just about gay people? Can it be straight people too? It's like, it's a book about gay people. I mean, that's what it's about, you know? It's like, it go, you know, like saying to a woman who's a feminist who's written a feminist book, oh, it should be more about men. Why can't, this should be for men to read. It's like, well, if they want to make it about men too, that's up to them, but it's, it's a book about women and mm. feminism. It's a book about women and feminism. Mm. So that's saying, well, why don't make it about cats or tigers? So, no, that's what it's about. So, you know, it's difficult because we are a kind of, you know, this is quite, you know, comparatively, that we're, we're, you know, we're a minority. So mm. what would be considered to be a hit for a specific LGBT book is not necessarily the same for a mainstream book. So I do understand there are financial constraints because they're because you know like a book like mine is considered to be really successful but it's not sold as many as you know harry potter <laughs> sadly yeah. um so um yeah so it's it's complicated i think but yeah hopefully there'll be some progress yeah um and then i also wanted to talk about straight jacket which you mentioned um so it focuses on homophobic culture and how that affects the mental health of gay men. And I wondered if you could talk about what inspired you to write the book and what you would like people to take away from reading it or what you wanted to achieve with writing it. Um, have you read it? No, I haven't read it. I will read it. <laughs> and, <laughs> have you read it? No, it, 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 <laughs> I just wondered what, if you had what you might think of it. How old are you, by the way? 21. 21. I mean, I mean it's quite a painful book to read and it's not mm. really a book I mean, I say this at the beginning of the book, it's certainly not really a book for people coming out. Mm. Uh, not that I'm saying you're coming out, but just um, it, it's a painful book about the fact about what's, what I don't think has gone right um, the, over the last few decades that, you know, there's this explosion of positivity um, and this focus on, oh, everything's great. And everyone thinks, you know, lots of people, lots of people, privileged people think, oh, it's all great and it's wonderful. Certainly you can live, you know, pretty he healthy, happy life yeah. if you're, it's certainly if you're gay or bisexual or lesbian um, and trans, but, you know, there's still problems. But basically, that's the thing. that There are still a lot of problems. And I think we hadn't really talked about the, me the mental health impacts. And I had certainly grown up not feeling very good about myself, drinking too much, engaging in kind of like um, compulsive, not always healthy behavior. And no one could explain to me why. And no one talked about it. And if you ever talked about said oh I think it's something to do with my sexuality everyone would say no 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 because you they kind of went ag against the idea that you know th there was just this kind of uh, PR campaign of positivity around gayness because everyone had said so many terrible things you know the world had been so homophobic the whole point of the gay rights movement to say no it's great to be gay it's all wonderful mm -hmm. and I'm not saying it's not it's just that there are problems for some of us that you know like growing up not feeling very good about yourself can have can make you feel not very good about yourself mm -hmm. and I think some parts of gay culture are an expression of that. Um, you know, uh, I think it's a complicated thing, but the kind of like sex culture part of gay culture can be a bit bonkers. Um, and, you know, like I said, there's a drugs problem amongst a significant drugs problem amongst some gay and bisexual men. And I just think we need to talk about that. I, I had lot, you know, lost quite a lot of friends to drug overdoses or accidents where they've been drunk and they've fallen down the stairs or whatever. And I just think, I just thought we needed to talk about it. So like I say, it, it's a painful, intense read, but mm. I think for me, um, gay culture needs to evolve from not just being about pride, pride and positivity, but also about healing and about acknowledging, you know, what the world has done to us and healing some of that if we need to. Not, not, not everybody does. There's, you know, I, I say in the book, there's loads of um, healthy, happy, thriving LGBT people. And um, in terms of numbers, there's more straight people in the world. And so there are far more of them with those problems, you know, addiction or depression or whatever. It's just that proportionately we have, mm -hmm. statistically, we have higher levels of them. 
and it's just something that I think we all need to just talk about and, and look out for in, our, in ourselves and amongst our friends um, to just offer support if it's needed. Yeah, yeah. I think that's kind of what I was would feel about um, the whole like championing LGBT as like that's why I would be cautious of those kind of narratives that are celebrating and positive when there is still that kind of existence of people going through difficulty and mm. and I just it is kind of like an impossible thing of how do you how do you tackle that at the same time as also being positive about it yeah it's really hard yeah um and then next I was also going to ask you about your um play blowing whistles um because I saw that there was a rehearsal reading recently mm. um, so I wanted to ask you if you could explain the premise of that play and um because I read that it celebrates gay culture, but it actually critiques it in terms of critique it. So I wondered if that was an accurate description of your play and whether that was a kind of trend of your writing as well. Of That's a sort of similar thing that you've tackled in both areas. Yeah, being negative, basically. <laughs> no, I mean... No, no, I sometimes worry that. It is, I think it's because I grew up with um, uh, a frustration that... Everything was positive, 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 positive. But mm. I saw a lot of people. I knew I was struggling. I knew so many people I knew were struggling without breaking people's confidences. You know, where I worked and, you know, at the Stone War, I worked there. There were sometimes problems with people I met there. When I worked at Ashu, there were quite a lot of people I've met over the years. You know, someone who had worked in the office killed themselves. Somebody else who was the agony aunt of another gay magazine killed himself. Um, mm. So a lot of problems, a lot of people doing things which didn't seem to be making them happy. And I just felt like, hold on a minute, we just need to talk about this stuff. And I was very confused um, about it all. And I, want, I loved theatre, wanted to write a play. Um, and uh, there was a, a playwriting competition, competition that Soho Theatre did about... Um, they had a postcard of two people standing in the in the road, and you had to write a fifteen minute play about it. And I so I wrote about a couple having a row in the street uh, <laughs> on Gay Pride Day, and we did it, and it evolved, and eventually ended up being in the play. What was the question again? What was the question again? What was it? Was it? Was it? I was wondering what the premise of your play was. Oh, what's it about? Sorry, so I've just rambled about <laughs> something. That's it's, why I was basically, it's about um, yeah, it's about um, a couple who've been together for twenty years. Uh, on the Friday night before Gay Pride in London, which is also their anniversary. I think it's 23, 24 years. Um, and they get a young man round off of Grindr for a threesome. And it's about how it affects their relationship over the course of the weekend. So it's a kind of dark comedy. And yes, it, you know, the first half is very kind of upbeat and funny and kind of... Um, was reflective of a lot of the plays I was seeing at the time where gay plays where it was all a bit like oh we're gay and so we do all these kind of like nutty things and isn't it funny ha 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 kind of where you're all in on the joke um and then in the second half it basically says just asks questions of maybe some of our attitudes do we need, maybe need to talk about them and are they more um problematic than perhaps we might ever stop to think about so hopefully there'll be a new production with any luck I'm quite yeah I think because it went really well on Thursday so or Tuesday or whenever it was so um yeah I think I think there may well be fingers touch wood um what? oh yeah so the the next bit I just wanted to ask you about was to do with your being an editor of Attitude um so I was going to ask you what motivated you to join Attitude in the first place uh, well, it was a long time ago, so it would have been, I was at university, so it would have been your age when oh. Astrid began. Was that when you, is that, was that your first beginnings of your career? Was that yeah, oh. yeah. So I wanted to work in the media and I was doing work, work experience at Capital Radio. And um, then I did work experience at Stonewall. And I, it would, 1994, I was at university when Attitude started. And it was kind of, it was in a time where the 80s had been horrendous with, the, you know, the devastation of HIV and AIDS and all the homophobia that came along with it. Um, an attitude was begun to um, be a different type of publication from the gay publications that were around that were very political and heavy and talking about, you know, really important things, but were quite intense and people felt maybe, you know, a little bit downbeat and depressing, which they had to be because those were the times. 
So that was the idea that they were they would start a, a new magazine that was fun and upbeat. That was kind of like the face, which was the big kind of star magazine at the time. Um, so I was re I really loved that as a twenty one year old. I was very excited about that. Loved it. I was working at Stonewall, which is my kind of my first job. I was doing work experience, kind of voluntary work there, and then I ended up getting a job there. And then um, uh, went to Attitude as work experience, and eventually they yeah they gave me a job and kind of I left and came back over the years and eventually became editor. Um, and I think I just wanted to say something about I I, it was all, I suppose it was. It, the recurrent theme is that I felt like I wasn't seeing my experience reflected mm. in uh, mainstream gay culture and I just wanted to kind of try and stick my nose in and have my say basically. Yeah, yeah. And, and linking to that what career highlights did you have from your time as editor and why? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, there were loads. I mean, it was weird because to be there that long, over 20 years, you could yeah. see different time changes and things yeah, like that. I was, yeah. was going to ask also, how, how did it change as well over your time? Uh, with, um, so maybe well, I'll put that one first and then the career. There were so many changes. I mean, it, you know, it kind of, um, I think the tone of the magazine changed, like, from mm. being, you know, throughout, throughout the first 10 years when I was there, it was all kind of, like, fun and... Um, upbeat and things start to change so we would be very kind of like superficial and frivolous and things like we did did this naked issue that was ripped off from well, I say ripped off inspired by cosmopolitan magazine that would do the same thing in like charity naked mm. issue um so you get all these celebrities taking their clothes off like will meller um i don't know if you know him he's in two pints of lager and a packet of crispies you know in hollyoaks he was mm. you know he's still quite famous but but i think that about and all the kind of big celebrities like robbie williams when he left take that gave attitude his first uh cover interview so i think that was really exciting to be part of that because up until that point celebrity mainstream straight celebrities wouldn't talk to gay magazines because it was mm. considered to be really controversial so being part of that was incredible and all the kind of key moments where i think attitude you know some people are very critical of attitude and say oh it's not you know it's a lifestyle it's not political enough but actually it did play a, a significant part i think in the sense that the media allowed the mainstream media a way into gay culture because we would get these big interviews with celebrities mm -hmm. they would then reflect that so for instance someone would do a big interview and it would go in the sun or uh you know whatever the guardian and all the kind of tabloids that was a really positive thing for people who read those tabloids who've been told up until then that gay people were terrible awful people to suddenly see that david beckham had given a cover interview and saying i don't mind if, if men fancy me was actually a really significant thing for the country mm -hmm. to see i think so those things are so like when um uh, Tony Blair, um, I think we were all quite clever actually because you know no one told us to do this but you know we got Tony Blair to give an interview to um, Attitude which I think was 2004 I think I can't remember it might be 2005 but it was the first time a, a serving prime minister had given an, an interview to a gay magazine and, and sat for the cover and so it was a that was a really big deal David Beckham in 2002 that was a big de big deal and soap stars and pop stars and then 2005 was a really big year with um heath ledger for brokeback mountain who did gave us an exclusive interview and um madonna which i did got to interview madonna which was that that was a real highlight for me because i've grown up loving her um when she launched her album in attitude globally which was incredible and david furnish and elton john when civil partnerships came in so we were kind of like um reflecting all these changes which uh, i think was an amazing mm. thing to do. what was the first part of the question the second part was the changes it was the changes highlights. In your highlights yeah so i guess so all that was great but me, me being editor i suppose writing about mental health in 2010 because no one had done that before mm. and, I, and that helped people and that ended up leading to my book and you know i get messages every week from people across the country and the world saying you've really helped me so that's great to be part you know to know that you're part of a discussion mm. that is making some having an impact and also the, my last issue, which was with the Prince William, where he sat for the cover for the mm. first time, a member of the royal family had done that and gave their first statement against homophobic, bi, transphobic bullying. Um, so that was, and that got, you know, uh, uh, kind of um, reported on all over the world. So that was, yeah, that was amazing. But it was so much, it was a lot of fun over 20 years, a long time. <laughs> um. And I wondered also, related to that, whether you found, whether you had any 
difficulty in your career um were there any kind of barriers based I guess it's kind of different because you weren't attitude that there weren't going to be those kind of barriers as a journalist um being a gay person um but I just wondered if you encountered any barriers or if anyone you knew um I would say like having dealings with straight or the mainstream media uh -huh. is quite complicated because as I said earlier on, maybe with the publishing, the way they're interested in what's interested in what's interesting about gay issues to them is not necessarily the same about things that should be reported. Like, for instance, I did a big thing about a homophobic bullying and met these parents whose kids had killed themselves and things like that because they've been homophobically bullied. And I tried to get to write to news TV programs to ask them to cover it and they just don't get it and they wouldn't cover it. And they said, oh, we've done bullying. And I said, well, it's not quite, it's a very specific thing, homophobic bullying, because you know, often kids are being bullied before they even know they might be LGBT. You know, often they can't tell the teachers because that's to out themselves. They can't tell the parents because that's to out themselves. Um, and they just didn't get it and they've never really covered it and they don't really care. And so those things were really, really um, frustrating. And all, uh, I suppose the, the big problem uh, attitude for me was the internet, the fact that the internet was becoming a thing. So it meant that magazines, which were really dominant in the culture and newspapers certainly were not selling as many and not as important because you get the information there and then whereas before when I was growing up you know you'd be waiting for a magazine to read about your pop stars and you know albums coming up that's where you'd find out about it and it was all really really amazing and exciting and cutting edge whereas now it's all you literally someone can tweet it you know of the scratching their nose and just put a, a tweet out and change the whole world <laughs> um so that was really difficult on a professional level and also just um you know getting things right and trying to be um you know trying to be diverse and to be intelligent when basically you know like the whole issue about kind of body image and things like that like someone said to me what you said to me once attitude was quite well known for doing these sexy covers it's not all we did but lots of people seem to think that's all we did because those were the covers they would buy so people would sometimes be critical someone said oh you never put, you never put steve you're a body fascist you never put stephen fry on the cover so we did put stephen fry on the cover and it sold really badly which is not a not a um not a criticism of him or a reflection of how popular he is because he's incredibly popular with millions of followers on Twitter. It's just a reflection of, of what people come to gay magazines for. So that was kind of difficult. And, and I am aware of it. I criticise gay, gay magazines and that body fascist thing myself in straight jacket. Um, but it's very, very complicated because there's these market forces. So I'd be constantly trying to do different things and putting different, you know, more in, intellectually led cover stars on the cover or your things that I thought were you know, more important or culturally relevant. And unless you put shirtless man with, you know, pecs on the cover, it, people wouldn't buy it. Mm -hmm. So it was, that was really difficult. And, you know, you get shouted at by my boss occasionally. Um, so that was, that was difficult. Yes, that is like a lot of pressure, especially, I mean, for the magazine as well, of like being trend setting at the same time as, well, like appealing to the consumer at the same time as also making a change and making a difference well yeah because if you're the editor and like for, you know that we i mean i won some awards some british society of magazine editor awards which was really proud of my predecessor did too mm -hmm. which was a miracle i thought considering that we had a, like a, a fraction of the budget of these big magazines like, no, no, a fraction of the support that they have in terms of you know like the infrastructure of big companies and hr departments and it and all that kind of stuff but yet we still managed to win beat them sometimes um but yeah, like if you're the editor of GQ, you're just doing a nice, lovely, pretty magazine. You, you've not got everyone saying, oh my goodness, you're, you're misrepresenting the community. You're doing this. You're making people feel that, you know, like you have this whole huge weight of uh, politics and culture that comes with editing a magazine. And I remember another gay magazine editor said, said uh, not about me, about himself saying, I'm a journalist, not an activist. Because I think you, you, you're not that if you're mm. editing a gay magazine. You are an activist too, because you are, you are pushing a kind. You are kind of trying to promote a kind of social political agenda of you know, LGBT equality or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's compl it's complicated, and people don't give yeah understand that. And so I found it very difficult on Twitter when everyone was just every, when there'd be a lot, load of people slagging you off. Um, I remember when we did um, a football. You know, the thing is, finding people to put on the cover is quite difficult. People that are famous that will do it, that people will buy, that will make people go out and buy it. And if you do, and it's all very well, people say, well, it doesn't matter, why are you worrying about what, you know, sales figures? Well, if you don't get sales figures, yeah. 
it ends and you're all out of a job and everybody that you employ is out of a job as well. So you have to make the magazine sell. So there was one time there was a footballer. Um, you can't, you could not get footballers. There was a documentary about Justin Fashionu, the gay footballer who killed himself. And you could, they couldn't get, they could only get one straight mainstream famous footballer to speak to in this documentary because the industry is quite homophobic and freaked yeah. out about gay stuff. So there was one guy, I can't remember, Matt Jarvis from West Ham United, um, who agreed to pose for the cover. And it was reported in The Guardian. It was still considered to be, you know, a surprising thing for a footballer to do. So he's a straight man. So he put him on the cover thinking it's, you know, he's handsome. That's part of it. We knew it's going to sell well. He took his shirt off. All good. Great. Um, But also it was a kind of significant cultural thing to happen. And someone tweeted at me, uh, Matty Todd obviously got bullied by straight men when he was younger. He's obsessed with them. Uh, can't wait till he dies. And so they don't uh, do that anymore. Mm. And you just think, okay, well, that's not what I'm here for, to be told that you want me to be dead, basically. Mm. When I've actually, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. stood on streets shaking tins and doing petitions and outside the House of Commons. And, you know, like, since I was, you know, like, 20, that really pissed me off. Not that I'm, not that I'm bitch bitter about it now but i just think yeah it was a different world then yeah. and i think going into any kind of public life or whatever be it journalism or anything bigger than that it's a completely different experience now because you're basically yeah i guess like, also that's like what you said about um the rise of the internet of information being you think is also people have more power and, and anonymity and they can just use that to be critical and air their views and more people can see it um, and then see they've got even more of that pressure and profile than you did before and that kind of thing. Well there's a lot of problems in the world aren't there and a lot of people are stressed understandably but unfortunately we're in a place where people don't join together and uh, you know fight the kind of things that they need to do you know the people who are in the, the institutions that are causing these problems yeah. they take it out on each other on, on social media. Mm. Well, there we go. Um, so linking to journalism, I wondered if you had any kind of tips or advice for people, specifically LGBT, who are looking to get into journalism, or how, how do you think journalism has changed? Or, or well, changed well, while you were? It's really complicated because part of me wants yeah. to say don't go into gay journalism because it's dying on its arse. Oh. And, um, you know, there's only a few kind of websites and things like that, like Pink News that does well. Yeah um that said there is more media being produced you know like netflix and amazon prime and things like that and people making like big there's blumhouse in america which is an american horror studio that's making quite a few gay documentaries so there is a market for documentaries and films and things like that uh, which is changing and books but in terms of journalism i mean yeah it's difficult it's mm. difficult but i think a lot of young people certainly it was the case for me went into gay journal journalism because I was motivated it was kind of like a way of it's almost like therapy a way of kind of um wanting to say what I wanted to say wanted to change things wanting to help people wanted to kind of maybe you know create a narrative that wasn't there that would have helped me when I was younger so there's that but if you really want money if you want a successful career that's not necessarily the way yeah. to go it's not there's not a lot of money in it uh, but I do think the mainstream media, like, I mean, it's changing a bit in a way, but really they are, it's not, I would say they're homophobic in the sense they hate gay people. I mean, a lot of the media is very, very transphobic, as you can see mm -hmm. every Sunday, there's a barrage of abuse of trans people in the Sunday Times and lots of other places. And again, it's that thing, they don't know what they don't know. So it's like, I understand some of these discussions need to be had, but trans people need to be able to speak up in them fairly too. And the media doesn't let you... It's not, I'd say it's more the class thing is the biggest issue, that the media is run by rich people that have been to public school. I mean, and other people do make their way too, but absolutely, for sure. I mean, I've done all right, but um, you do better if you're posh mm. yeah. and come from money because they just relate to you more and you'll just do better that way. So it is very unfair. Um, and... I know gay journalists who really play down that, that, that side of who they are to be successful. So it's not easy. It's, the world is not as easy as people Make it. think it is, yeah. Hmm. Um, 
And then, so moving away from journalism, I just had a couple of questions about Pride Month. So I just wondered what your views are on Pride Month, sort of as it's become a kind of commercialised um, entity sort of thing with like um, brands changing their logos, I guess, because all the other brands are doing it and that kind of, whether you think it's a good thing that it's being, because it raises a profile or another view. <laughs> I'm not very good on questions like this because <laughs> in the media, it's quite good if you've got like a, yes, it's absolutely this or it's that. Yeah. So in the media, they ask you to come on and argue on the radio about yeah. like, like, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. And the other person saying, it's terrible, it's terrible. Yeah. Whereas I do think I'm quite balanced. In the on, yeah, in the sense that I think this is really complicated. What I do think is I really hate is the way brands and companies dominate pride marches. The way if you go on there, it literally looks like a, a parade of like a cat from a catalogue of big corporations, like all companies, car companies, banks, mm. supermarkets. I just think that's ridiculous because that's not what it's about. It's meant to be about the community. It's meant to be about activists and political things and social things. I think that's bonkers and just a, a nightmare. Um, I have. I think it's really complicated. The whole thing about Pride Month. I think when I see people moaning about it, which they do, I kind of part of me thinks wants to say, you're moaning because a company is showing support for mm. LGBT equality. Yeah. Why? Why? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because when I was growing up, they never would have done that. They, you couldn't yeah. have forced them to at gunpoint. They would not have done that because everybody felt the opposite. So to have big corporations saying that, I think it can be a really important, powerful thing. My friend was working in America in... Um, Ohio a few years ago for quite a while and he said that he might have been a bit snobby before about Starbucks having a pride flag and in London or New York it's, it's, you know everyone just goes mm, sneers and doesn't think much of it but if you're in Columbus where it's quite you know relatively conservative to a degree I mean it's and actually Columbus is Ohio is quite balanced politically but it's mid of America um seeing a pride flag in starbucks is actually quite important you know because it's it, it's a signal to people that are actually you know we especially in america i think corporate america has a huge amount of influence and power over what happens in the world and i think i think it's very valid to make the argument that it's a really positive thing and then when people say oh well they're not giving any money to the thing it's not it's not like everyone's coming in just to buy Gay people go, I'm oh, only going to go in Starbucks. I mean, it's not completely cynical, I don't think. I think it is about their brand values. I think there are lots of gay people who work in these companies. I do understand when people don't get a bit, feel like it, they're being um, pink washed or whatever. Um, I've lost the train of my thought. Uh, what are we talking about? Banks and logos and and things like that. Oh, the, the other thing is, I sometimes think there's a certain t sense of entitlement in people thinking they should give money. They should, well, well why should they? Mm. I mean, I wish they would, but I, I think sometimes people don't understand that they don't do it for, there's not, they don't do it for black history month. They don't put logos and things on yeah. change all their logos. And they don't, there's not a feminist thing. There's not a, you, know, you might see a breast cancer awareness campaign. I mean, like it seems like pride month is this thing that's more important than everything else. So I think be careful. You know, people need to just just be careful what you wish for yeah. because you may just end up moaning about it, and they go, okay, well, cool. "We won't do it then. Yeah. We're just not doing it. The end of it. And that's it. Goodbye." Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I wonder whether, it, like, I do sometimes wonder, is it counterproductive doing it? I don't know. Does it does it yeah. does it piss people off because it seems to be the one thing that happens? It like it doesn't happen for other issues. I'm not saying it does. I'm just I think it's complicated, and I think yeah. the LGBT community tends to just come from a moaning about it position whereas i think it is quite complex i think it's quite complex sorry if that's a vague answer no that's a very good answer yeah and um, and then my last question was just going to be are there any things that you're doing to mark pride month doesn't have to be anything i mean like because i guess you had your play so that was kind of a was that yeah, I mean... actually, was that supposed to happen in this month for the reason of pride month. Uh, not from my point of view but they, they just they're doing a little festival at the, th at the theater the turbine theater in battersea in south london mm -hmm. for, for pride month so i suppose yeah i'm doing quite a lot of talks it's like it yeah, yeah. It, it's like i'm um, being one of santa's elves at christmas for me pride <laughs> month is when i got something to do so um yeah i do quite a lot of talks and things like that at companies which is good and charities and things yeah. like that which is a good thing to do to talk about 
history yeah and i'm just yeah so not not really i mean it's weird because obviously pride itself is not happening it's happening in september mm. in london yeah. um so uh pride month is like a continual thing for me because I'm yeah. still working in this in this uh field and i'm, I'm yeah i'm writing another book at the moment so yeah. um, that, could, yeah. that could be that's another question what are your plans in your career in um staying alive which is a weird <laughs> cool in this this, this day and age um yeah i'm writing another book uh i'm working on a one-man show about straight jacket about lgbt mental health which i'm really excited about hopefully we'll be on next year um yeah and i've got a few other projects and things i want to write another play as well but we'll see it is not easy <laughs> wish it was how that's a, I just thought of that question of so um with blowing whistles how difficult was it to get that play taken on was it the sort of did you already have it commissioned or uh it was easy to get it on unusually easy just because I was doing it uh, I was at a gay drama group um and they commissioned it so well they yeah they commissioned it when it was a 15 minute sketch that we did originally a play yeah. They commissioned it into a full-length play which then happened in 2003 i think um so that part was easy then yeah, i extended i kind of changed it again and then it went on warehouse theater in croydon in 2005 and then it had its big run in 2008 in london and it was on in sydney and things like that and there's a few small places in america i think getting it to the next level is the harder harder thing which i kind of i think i don't know I'm not saying it's the greatest thing ever, but I think it, it could have had a bigger run, like a little run in the West End. Yeah. Um, and getting to that level is much harder, which we haven't done yet. So that's that's the idea. That's that's yeah. hope. Yeah. That's hard. It's hard. And then yeah, and the fact that it's a gay thing as well, that makes it more difficult. Yeah. Less people are, you know, less producers are interested. Yeah. Um, but we'll see, fingers crossed. Yeah. Great. I think that was all my questions. So Come awesome. Thanks very much, Zach. All right. Thanks, Ruffy.